Mount Pleasant is working pretty well. I think the Monday and Tuesday labs, you guys sort of got it, yeah. It was certainly nice. Sorry about the Apple issues, but um, um, we're gonna continue with our sort of soil, our grand soil tour and talking about soil taxonomy today. Um, I wanted to sort of premise this you know, you guys are seeing, this is the landscape that you guys are seeing this week out in, out, out in the field. Okay, so down here is we've got Howard Gravelly Loams. We're not actually seeing Howard Gravelly Loams where we are, but we're basically looking at this low, these bottom lands down here, and we're looking at these upper areas right in here. Okay, what I wanted to, to, to convey to you guys is that there's a lot of stuff going on in between, and as we go through these landscapes, imagine what's going on between here and here. Okay, now the people that have been up in the field, you guys have seen this more at the top, and you've seen it's really an eel that's down at the bottom, but you guys have seen these two different soils. Okay, there's a dramatic transition between these soils through. Okay, all basically have the same parent material. The depth of the parent material may be different. The big difference here is we're looking at this topo sequence. We're looking at how this landscape is changing in space. Okay, now, in general, all of these soils are going to be in the same order, give or take. Now, the talk that we're being giving today, and we started it on Monday, what we're going to be talking about is how these characteristics change in space and time. Okay? What, in this case, we're basically looking at climate changes. Yeah, there's some slope changes here too, certainly when you're talking about the Eries. But we're really talking about sort of climate changes, and when I talk about climate changes, I'm talking about mostly about moisture. We're also seeing some changes in parent material because the parent material as it moves down to the bottom, we're getting sediments coming down, whether it's alluvial or colluvial, but we're looking at different parent materials down here. Even though those parent materials came from either the bedrock or the above, the sediment up here, the till. Certainly as the climate changes, we're certainly going to get different biological organisms in here. Okay, down here it's wet. Certainly, you're going to get more organisms that are anaerobic or faculta facultative anaerobes that can use other things than oxygen for respiration. And that's going to drive much of the processes that are happening here. On top of that, part of this is now agriculture. We're changing the organisms that are in there. Those of you that have been out in the field already, we have those two pits. One of the pits is in, out in the middle of the field. One of the pits is in the forested area. Okay, they are both marden soils. They're both mapped as marden soils, but you can see a dramatic difference between the two. That difference is due to management. Okay, so the tour that we're going to be taking today and on Friday is going to go through the soil orders. As we go through these soil orders, I want you to think about what are the driving characteristics that distinguish one soil order from the other. In some cases, it's parent material, that's all. In some cases, it's climate. In most cases, it's a modification of all five of the soil forming factors over some period of time, over some area of space. Okay, feels good? Good premise? So this is where we're going to start. Okay, I actually showed you this slide, but we're going to start here. Okay, this is the keys to soil taxonomy. Each one of those questions, this is basically the, it's kind of like we did with the soil texture. I ask you a question and it's a yes or no. If it's a yes, you got an answer. If it's a no, you keep following. Okay, and each one of these represents a specific question that is diagnostic for that type of soil order. So remember, I'm looking for characteristics that are the key distinguishing factor for some sort of soil, okay? And that distinguishing factor basically puts it into one or, or another order, okay? The very first question up here is soils with permafrost. So the very first soil that we're going to look at is the jello soils, soils with frost, permafrost within one meter of the soil surface or Cryoturbation, gelic materials, materials that are formed through frost processes, and permafrost within two meters of the soil surface. Okay, this is a map just showing the distribution 
across the world, across the United States. And this is what these soils look like. This is what that landscape looks like. Okay, you see this is sort of a, an aerial photo of a larger expanse. Here's some water in here. But do you see these sort of large cracks? These cracks are basically forming from frost, expansion and contraction, expansion and contraction. Okay, as the, frost, as the water gets frozen, it expands. And then it, as it thaws, it contracts or it melts. It becomes water, basically. Okay, if you get a, a picture closer up, this is what you're looking at. Very large features. In the wintertime, this crack is going to fill back up. Summertime, it opens up again. So you can imagine how much turbulence, how much cryoturbation is going to be occurring in this type of landscape. Now, as this expands and closes up, what's going to happen to the material that has fallen in to the crack? It's going to stay down here. It's not going to pop up. What's going to happen is the stuff that's down here is going to get closed in, and the stuff at the edges is going to pop out. Let's draw this. Here's my crack. And the crack collapses. OK, so things fall in to this crack, right? When it freezes, it's going to close up. The stuff that's fallen down here isn't going to like pop out. It's going to get trapped. And if it gets trapped, the forces of this pressure is going to start forcing things this way. Does that make sense? And things are actually literally going to come up to the top. This is like uh, New England with rock farming. Okay, rocks move their way up every time it freezes. Okay, well. I now have a pile of stuff up here. So my crack now looks like this with a pile of stuff. Sooner or later, this crack is going to open up again. And if it opens up again, this stuff is going to crash down in here. Does that make sense? And so as a result, we end up with a cycle of cryoturbation. Does that make sense? Now, the interesting thing about these, and this is where that question about where the depth was, the interesting thing about these is this cryoturbation can literally bury things. This horizon right here, this is a frozen horizon. That's permafrost, CEF. Above it is an O horizon, an organic horizon, and above that is an A horizon. What's happening? This process is so active that it's basically mixing the organic stuff down to the bottom, the mineral stuff at the top. That's pretty cool. Here you have a series of them. You have an O at the top, you have a C, you have a more O, and then another C. Frozen material here, C material here, that's the mineral material that's being cycled up. I've got O material forming on top, and I've basically buried another O. Cool? The prime here basically means that this OA is, in essence, the same as this OA, and it has been bisected by this C material. These, at one time, were probably one, well, I can't, I'm not sure, but this at one time was probably one horizon, and the frost is basically broken in half and mixed material inside of it. <coughs> Just to give you an idea about how the, this is really, the, you can see the morphology here. This is the pressure that's being, here's the crack, and it's basically morphing this material. You can see the horizons. It's being morphed because it's being expanded, pushed up. Pretty cool? All right, so let's go to the next question. The next question basically asks us, basically comes out with histosols. And these are histosols, these are organic soils that basically have to have at least 20 to 30 percent organic matter. The question itself is, soils with, organic, uh, soils with organic soil materials extending down to an impenetrable layer or with an organic layer that is more than 40 centimeters thick and without andex soil properties. If I have that, I have a histosol. 
This is a map showing the distribution of histosols soils in the United States. And are you surprised where those soils are? Does it make sense? What type of things are going to produce organic accumulations? What? Wet and cold, right? So if I have wet zones, you should be looking at the wet zones right along the coastal plains here, all these sort of peaty areas up in here, Maine, the Adirondacks. Does that make sense that you would see them there? You'd also see them along the edges of Alaska, up in the rainforests up here. Lots of organic matter, lots of water. Some sort of slowing down of, of decomposition. Okay, just because I have lots of organic matter, that could also mean I could have lots of decomposition. I need to have lots of organic matter, but more importantly, I need to have lower rates of decomposition than I have of production. Go. What are andic properties? Andic properties are andosols, and they're volcanic, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so does that make sense? Where am I going to get accumulations of organic matter? Any place that my rates of accumulation, primary production, are faster than my decomposition rates. So what slows down decomposition rates? Moisture and temperature. It's one of the major reasons why we have cold regions that have organic matter accumulation. It's not like up here that we have lots and lots of organic matter production. What's going on here is not really. What's going on here is we have really, really slow, slow rates of decomposition. That's why you find it long in here. It's really cold. Go. Why is it down in Florida? That, that would be like more, I would assume that. We have rates of production that are so high that decomposition rates are slowing down. And we got lots of water. The minute this stuff hits the water and goes anaerobic, it still decomposes, but it slows down. OK, around here we have some of these as well. These are muck soils. Uh, anybody been up to the north end of the lake, to Montezuma or in that area? Anybody out from uh, western New York, Cas uh, not Casanova, uh, mind blank. Western New York, some of the peat, uh, the, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, how about uh, Montgomery County, anybody from Montgomery County? Anybody in a county that grows lots of onions or cabbage or things like that in New York State? OK, that, those pro crops are basically being grown on these muck soils. These are organic soils that basically have been drained. OK, now if I drain these organic soils, what do you think is going to happen to them? I'm going to start, it's going to become erosive. But more importantly, if I drain them, I'm changing the decomposition environment. These soils were formed because of either some sort of climate condition. And around here, that climate condition was these soils formed underwater, basically. Accumulations of organic matter, year after year after year, basically underwater. If I drain that water out, I'm basically putting out a smorgasbord for all the decomposing organisms that are out there, because these soils now become oxygen rich. Now, the, soil, the farmers around here that have these muck fields realize this. And so what have they done? When the crop is not in the ground, they basically flood their fields again. They brought the water right back up to stop the decomposition. But even when they do that, there is a period of time that the soils have to be dry. And so as a result, there is decomposition. Now, this is a slide that I pulled off of the, of, off the web. But basically, here's an organic soil that's wet. You dry it, what happens to it? Shrinks dramatically. So even if I don't have decomposition, what's happening to my fields? If I start here, I'm going to be ending up down there. What do these soils look like? What kind of colors do you see? Nice, dark, rich, organic soils. Okay. All right, questions about this one? All right, let's move on to the next question. Okay, so I've got jello soils, I've got rid of the ice soils, and I've gotten rid of organic soils. OK, so let's go to the next question. And the next question is really about alluviated irons, spodic materials, and alluviated organic materials, OK? Spodosols, OK? The question itself is soils with spodic horizons. Now, spodic horizons 
you know, technical term, we already talked about what a splitic horizon was last lecture. But basically, a splitic horizon is this horizon with alluviated humic materials, organic materials, and iron and aluminum oxides. We traditionally find these soils in cool, humid, temper, temperate environments with coarse textured parent material. But you'll notice a big, huge chunk of them right down in here. Okay, these are called groundwater spotted soils. And basically what's happening here is we have the same type of vegetation that we have up here, similar type of vegetation, but we also have high groundwater. So the groundwater is actually driving these systems. The same coarse texture, sands, we find here as well. Adirondacks, the North Country, up in Maine, that area, and then up into the rainforest, and a huge chunk of Alaska. Okay? What do these soils look like, or the landscape? These are pictures from out west and from North Country. This is what these soils look like. Okay, so I've got this spodic material. I'm being formed on an organic material that, as it decomposes, forms lots of acids. Those acids start getting into the soil, and they basically strip material. They weather material. Okay? You see these E horizons, in this case a very bright E horizon. The organic matter hits the surface. It starts decomposing. You see a nice dark horizon up at the top of those E's. Starts stripping through. Those organic acids start moving down, and as they strip through, they're also transforming the iron and aluminum oxides. Those are being solubilized as well. They're all being moved downward. Nice zone right here of organic alluviation, right here as well. In this case, you don't see a lot of reds, but in here you see a lot of reds. That's the iron oxides. Really pretty soil. Really pretty soil. Okay. Now, in most cases we see this sort of classic E with striping that's down below into these BHs and BHSs. In some cases, it's not quite as pretty, but you can start seeing that sandy, this is very coarse textured material. There's my E, my A or O up at the top, or O and A up at the top, and then I'm moving into these BHSs down in here. Feel cool about this one? So let's move to the next question. The next question is actually about andesols or volcanic soils. Okay? Volcanic ash parent materials, the mineralogic content is dominated by amorphous materials. Okay, so what do I mean by amorphous materials? Imagine I have this magma. Okay? And we've talked about this magma is mixed up of all different types of ingredients or elements. Okay? And as those elements cool, they form crystals. Right? Now, you can certainly imagine if it cools slower, I'm going to get larger and larger and larger crystals. Does that make sense? Well, imagine I have a volcanic event. That's basically taking this magma and throwing it out into the air and flash freezing it. Okay? Those crystals don't have an opportunity to form. I can't, it's the same ingredients, but the crystal lattice that makes up these minerals doesn't have that opportunity. And so as a result, we call it amorphous material. Same ingredients, no crystals, or very small crystals. And as a result, this stuff weathers very, very quickly. And in general, it's fairly fertile. It's got the same ingredients as everything else. It weathers fast, which means it releases all the elements that are in that amorphous material very quickly, hence fertility. Okay? So, Global distribution, basically the ring of fire. You can see huge chunks of it around here. There's actually a good chunk of it actually in the Mediterranean as well, and Iceland. Oh, I don't have my near the United States distribution. Oh, well, sorry. OK, so the actual question is soils with andic properties. Basically, these are low density, amorphous materials. They're glassy, they're pumicey type of material, and short range order minerals. Short range order basically means these amorphous materials. Okay? Where do I find this stuff? So the question is within 60 centimeters, either the mineral soil surface or the top of an organic layer, or between either mineral soil surfaces or on the top of an organic layer with andic soil properties, whichever is shallower. So in some cases, if I'm hitting a bedrock or something like that, I have a very shallow layer of material, it's still considered andic material. And from that andic material, it can become an andesol. 
Now it's important to note that just because I have the andic material, I've just had a volcanic eru eruption, that ash comes down. That does not in fact make an andic soil. I need to have soil formation occur on that andic soil for it to become an andic soil. If it is fresh material and nothing's happened to it, it's an entosoil. Do you guys remember what entosoil is? Recent soils. Those are the soils that show no development. Okay. In this case, it's probably going to be a very fast development to an andosoil. But right now, that's, if it is just an ash layer, it is an entosoil. Question. Andic is, I think it's a Japanese term, it comes from ando, and I think it means, means, I think it means volcanic ash. I can go back to that. Ando, and, Japanese meaning black soil. And, Japanese meaning ando, black soil. So the question was, vol does volcanic ash resist leaching more than regular ash, like wood ash? Like wood ash? Uh, I would suspect that the wood ash is easier to leach out, but I'm not, I wouldn't, I would, oh, wouldn't. The oh, the crystal formation. I mean, the, this, this, is, this is that amorphic stuff. So the question is, so this is crystal stuff. This is what that amorphic material looks like. Now, you guys remember the slides that I showed of crystals before? This does not look anything like that. This looks like, I mean, you have bubbles in it. You have, literally have bubbles in it from the air bubbles as this stuff is cooling. This is, I, mean, I say this with a, sort of a grain of salt, compare or relative to wood ash, this is more resistant to weathering. So I would think that the wood ash would move faster or weather faster, but that's not saying that this is really resistant to weathering. I mean, you can take that in your hand. Physically, this is easy to break. The glass is a little bit harder, but chemically, you know, it, this is the landscape. You know, this is, this is uh, Western United States. Anybody having a guess what this is? I'll give you a clue. This is pineapples. This is Hawaii. Okay, this is Dole Island. Actually, uh, not Dole Island, but it might as well be called Dole Island. Okay, this is in Hawaii. It's one of the islands that basically Dole owns for, or, for pineapple production. Uh, this is a map of Western United States. I knew I had the map in here, but basically what, this is a black and white photo. You can actually see these layers. Okay, here's the underlying expanding clay. So this is, this is product, probably product from weathering of that ash. But you can see the oldest layer, a buried A horizon. So the fo soil formed right here. Okay, then you had another event and a new soil is forming basically on top of it. This is the characteristic of these soils. You have event after event after event. Now granted, it might not be in our lifetime, but if you think about the lifetime of these soils from a soil timeline versus a, human, a biological timeline, this is a rather short time. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Classic layer after layer after layer after layer. Here's some more slides of it. You can see the C material down here. You can see all these different layers of stuff in here. There's the stuff. Uh, and the other thing, I brought this slide. This is younger than this one. And how do I know it? Well, it's more reds that I'm seeing over here. Go. None of volcanic ash is really fertile, is it? None of volcanic ash is what? Not, not all volcanic ash is really fertile. Not all volcanic ash is really fertile. And that's true. It depends upon what the mineralogy is of it. But in general, even if it has a really poor mineralogy for fertility, because it weathers so quickly relative to stronger crystals, more developed crystals, it tends to be, if you looked at the same mineralogy, because this one releases its minerals a little faster, it will, the relative fertility of this one's gonna be more than this. That doesn't necessarily mean that all ash is fertile. But in general, because it weathers quickly, it releases those nutrients quickly. Is that, does that address? Yeah. So your statement was, the statement was, not all ash, not all volcanic ash is fertile. And that's true. But relative to the mineralogy of the same material in a, a more developed crystal, it is true. 
And certainly when you think of all of the ash, different types of ash, depending upon what the elemental consti constituents of it are, it is more fertile. fertile. Mm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Volcanic ash in there, yeah. So the so the comment was, I know there's zones in Mexico where they, they there's a certain ash layer, and that and when they dig down to it, or they erode down to it, or they grow down to it, once you get to that point, you're not growing anything anymore. And so the question would be, why aren't you growing anything anymore? I mean, it could be a mineralogical thing. It also could be a pH thing. It could be a, a drought thing. There's a lot of different reasons. But just because it's volcanic doesn't necessarily mean it's fertile. Okay, so the next one is oxysoils. Okay, these are common in hot, humid climates. These are the old soils. These are those soils that were really red. And I got some slides I'll show you in a moment. But they're dominated by minerals that are either very resistant to weathering or are the end products of weathering. Okay, the iron and aluminum oxides and the kaolinites. Because of this age and this weathering, not the age, mostly because of the weathering, these soils are commonly infertile. Now, you've got to imagine here, you've got to think about this. Why have these soils never had an undergoing, or have never undergone renewal of material? Okay? These soils have to have been there a long time. They have to have gone on, undergone a lot of weathering. And in a dynamic environment like the Earth's system, one would think that somewhere down the line, whether it was a volcano or something like that, this material would have been renewed with fresher parent material. Okay? The reality is that the soils that we see, this is a picture of Pangaea 200 million years ago, and I want you to see that, look, take a look at this oval. This is sort of the center of this landscape. Okay? Now, most of, this pla of these plates, as they started separating, sort of moved away from each other and then came back and crashed. But this zone right in here, sort of the center of this oval, take a look at the continents now. These parts of the continents are really old. They haven't had a lot of activity. There's not a lot of volcanoes around here. There's not a lot of glaciation that's happened around here. Okay? These are at the center of these continents. And if you go back to this picture, you can sort of see right where that is. This stuff has been separating, and nothing has been really active in that area to renew or put in new material. So as a result, the distribution of these soils happens to be in this older landscape. We have some in the United States, in Puerto Rico to be exact, as well as some out in Hawaii. Now this is a really good example of sort of the, the processes acting upon this. Okay? Puerto Rico, fairly old landscape. Hawaii, on the other hand, I mean, the big island, I'm not sure which, the, the Molokai, this is probably Oahu or something like that. One could imagine, this is, is anyone from Hawaii? Is this Oahu? <laughs> okay. Um, this is not that old of a landscape, but the parent material of it is volcanic. If the parent material of it's volcanic, it weathers really, really quickly. So as a result, this, the relative timeline between this oxisole and this oxisole is very different, but the product is the same. This is an older landscape. It's been there a lot longer. This is a younger landscape, but the material that's in it is so easily weathered, you can drive it to oxisole a lot faster. It can drive it through those weathering processes so much faster, producing these dominant minerals of quartz, iron, aluminum oxide, and kaolinite. Does that make sense? So we're looking at a relative change between here and here. A relative timeline change because of the nature of the parent material that it started with. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Is it, your brains are hurting right now? Go. Yeah, it, right in here, and part in here. These are pretty wet areas, you're right. But that soil fertility is not in the, the fertility is not in the soil, it's actually in the trees. 
It's in the vegetation. If you actually take a look at the soil, that soil is pretty infertile. It's all been captured in the trees. And this is the classic environment where you have slash and burn agriculture, Sweden agriculture, because the farmers know where the, f the fertility is. And what they'll do is they'll come into these environments, they'll slash the trees, they'll burn them, keep the ash in the soil, and they'll grow their crops. And they'll use the ash as the fertilizer. They can only do it for a couple years, though, because they're going to use up the ash. And then what they do is they let the, for the field rest. They let it be regenerated into the forest 20, 30 years. In 20, 30 years, the vegetation has collected enough nutrients. Not, there's not a lot there, but it's collected enough nutrients that you can come in, cut it again, and grow crops for two to three years. Okay? So the fertility is in, actually in the plants. The plants are basically storing it. There's not a lot of fertility in these soils because most of it's been weathered away. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Kind of? If you want to grow crops in this, these types of fields, you're going to have to go to the Sweden agriculture and you're basically going to be looking at two to three years of cropping and 20 to 30 years of nothing or well forced. That's not nothing. That's actually pretty productive. Okay. Or you're talking about fertilizer. And in some of these environments, fertilizer really is a tough sell because they don't have the infrastructure to get it. Cool? Okay. All right, so let's take a look. Actually, great shot. We talk about Sweden agriculture. There it is. They've come in. This is a Sweden agriculture. This is, I don't know if you can see these. Um, kill one more band of lights, please. Sorry. Do you guys see this and this and this and this and this and this? That's corn. Here's the old field. You can see the forest in the background. They basically come through here, cut everything. It doesn't look like they burned all that much, but they'll burn and then they'll plant. They'll plant two or three years, take the corn or whatever they happen to be growing, cassava, whatever, the harvest, and then they'll let it go back to forest. This is what that landscape looks like. It looks pretty agriculture, but it's, the fertility is very low. This is what that, that, that landscape looks like. This is Central Africa. This is what that landscape looks like without agriculture. You can, this does not look like farmland, does it? Or potentially farmland. This looks more like grazing land. And that's because the fertility here is really low. What do these soils look like in the ground? There is a shot. And here you can actually see this is, Sudan, this is cane, I think. Cane on the side here. Okay, you can see these red roads. You can see organic enrichment up here, but this is all iron and aluminum oxides with kaolinic clays. Really weathered stuff. Yes, they're growing. My guess is they're fertilizing. It's not coming from the soil. Now the truth is, if you're growing this type of intensity, even in really nutrient-rich soils, you're going to be fertilizing. I mean, you're just harvesting so much. You're harvesting more crop than the soil can provide nutrients for. Okay, but do you see this landscape? Red, really rich, red. Here's some more pictures, and this is actually a pretty more blatant one right here. Can you see the darkness here? The darkness, the dark colors here, the darkness. <laughs> okay, here's another one where you're looking at your termite, termite mound and a sort of a, a zone of, this is a quartz dike that's in here. Okay, remember quartz is, that's, uh, that is extremely resistant to weathering, silica oxide. It doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it anyway. Okay. Here's that color, that red. Now, you guys have seen this color in some of the monoliths that we have in the lab. Iron, aluminum oxide, just red. OK, cool. Questions? I wish I could have taken you guys to Puerto Rico to see these things, but this is the best I can do. All right, so let's move to the next soil, a vertisoil. Okay? These are soils that are formed in a clay parent material, a very specific type of clay parent material, a, a parent material that has a huge shrink swell capacity. These are smectitic clays. If you wet them up, literally you put water in them, they expand. Not that other clays don't, but these guys expand a lot. When you dry them, they shrink. Expansion, contraction, just like the jello soils. In fact, these behave very similar to the gel soils, but it's not frost, it's the clay that's actually doing the expansion. Big chunks of them, parts of Africa, huge chunks of India, 
parts of Texas right in here, okay? You need to have a climate that's dry enough for the shrink swell, but you need to have enough moisture that you can form these minerals, okay? Here's the distribution in the United States. Huge chunks in Texas, up the Mississippi, some in the northern Dakotas and Montana, and there's some out here as well. There is actually a good chunk of it out here in western New York, just south of Buffalo. And this is what that material looks like. Look at this slot first, the, 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 this picture down here first. The, the cuts, when the expansion, the cracks, are not anywhere near as big as we saw in the gelosols. But they're fairly large. You can see this hand. This hand could reach right down in there. Okay? Now, what happens, just like the gelosols, when they get wet, they're going to compact. Okay? And when they dry, you're going to for start forming cracks. Okay? If that crack starts forming, things are going to fall down into the crack. Right? So if I have stuff falling down into the crack, it's going to fill in. Okay? When it gets wet, it's going to expand. It can't expand against itself, so the relief, the relief of pressure is going to be up. Okay? So those arrows. Okay? Now, as a result, you're going to basically put, create a high in here and a low in here. And these cracks are going to be consistent. A year after year, it's going to be the same crack. Okay, you start cr creating a zone of weakness or a fracture of weakness, and that's where it's going to expand every year. Okay? So this stuff starts forming, down, falling down, it expands, it picks these highs. But the interesting thing here, unlike the ice, which basically thaws and disappears the next year, this stuff, the material stays behind. The clay is there. And what happens is you see these slip planes forming. These little arrows that are in here, you see the gray arrows that are, the gray lines that are in, intermixed with those arrows? Those are basically slip planes. So imagine that I'm expanding this clay, okay, and then I've got to force one one way or the other because of the pressure, and what's going to happen is I'm going to go like that. Does that make sense? Those are those slip planes. Here is the face of one of those slip planes, like that. And it's clay, so you can imagine I'm going to create this nice slick face. These are called slick insides. Slick insides. You can see them in this side. So you notice how all these are sort of angled off of a crack? 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 Basin, basin, basin. You can sort of see the highs at the top. Does that make sense? Pretty cool? Okay. This is what if they look like when you're looking down at them. These are the cracks. Fairly small scale. But if you build a foundation in this, each one of these, they only move 0.8 of a micron, an angstrom, you know. But if I've got millions of these individual particles of clay, they start building, building up, and that movement gets pretty dramatic. I mean, you can literally see right through this foundation, right through the wall of this house. This is what those landscapes look like. You know, they're good agricultural lands, but you don't want to be putting buildings on them. And if you do put buildings on them, you have to put something around this structure to absorb that expansion or contraction, or you need to put something around this structure that keeps it wet all the time or dry all the time. Otherwise, you're going to get this as a building. Cool? Now, remember us talking about structure? Certainly the Monday and Tuesday group has heard this, but remember we were talking about subangular and angular blocky, that's sort of the blocky structure, and there's subangular versus angular. This is angular blocky. Sharp, glass-like shard type of design. Go back one. I mean, you can imagine, now you're looking at this face on, but you can imagine that this is a sharp piece that's coming up together. Okay, this is angular blocky versus what we see around here, which is the subangular blocky. Okay, let's move on to the next soil. A dry climate. An aridus soil. We're basically looking soil at soils that are, are, are arid region. So these soils are based on climate. They're classified by climate. You look at the world, you basically look at the dry parts of the world, and that's where you're going to find these soils. This is the distribution in the United States. I mean, no big surprise here. Central Valley, Death Valley, Ridge and, you know, Ridge and Valley is the Great Basin. You know, that, that's no big surprise where you find these soils. 
this is what the landscape looks like. But you got to sort of think to yourself, well, if this is defined by the climate, I could have any kind of parent material. You know, the bio biology is going to be controlled by the climate. The topography, to a certain extent, is going to be controlled by the climate, too. I mean, you're going to have arroyas and things like that. Yeah, you're going to have geologic control as well. But we're really looking at a variety of different types of parent material. Okay? Sage, pavement, desert pavement, arroyas. These soils look distinctly different than each other, from each other. But they look distinctly different from every other soil order as well. Okay? This is an aridus soil. This is an aridus soil. The same processes are occurring in them, but the climatic conditions in this scenario is a little bit different than this one, and the parent materials of this one are different than this one. Okay? What are we seeing at the surface there? Salt. salt. Remember us talking about translocation of salts? This is the classic example where the translocation of salt goes up to the surface. In this scenario, it's a little wetter. So the salts don't go all the way to the top. But you can see the concentration, in this case, is actually carbonates, specific kind. But this is a concentration of carbonates. This is a co concentration at the surface. Let's take a look at some of these other. These concentrations can get so hard that it can become rock-like. This is carbonate, basically M cemented really rock-like. Here is some more cementation. You can see these, 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 these salts translocate and they concentrate. And if they sit there for a long time and I keep concentrating, keep concentrating, they become really rock-like. And this is due to that translocation. This is due to the moisture moving the salts. These can get really, really dramatic. I pulled this. I don't remember where I pulled this slide from, but that band right there, if you didn't know what you're looking for, you would, I mean, around here you'd say, oh, that's, that's shale or something like that, or limestone. That is a rock. But it's due to secondary mineralization. Sec soil formation has basically formed that. Underneath it, all loose residual material. This just happens to be so hard that it's basically creating a ledge. Pretty cool? The next one, alta soils. Okay? They are very similar to alpha soils, which we haven't talked about yet. But the difference between these alpha soils versus alta soils, alta soils have low base saturation. Okay? Base saturation, what does that mean? We already talked about this, but do you guys remember what base saturation is? Base saturation is the measure of bases or nutrients, elements, that are on or being stored by the clays, by the soils, organic matter and the soils. Okay, we'll talk a lot more about this when we start talking about colloids. Okay, but we're basically looking at fairly infertile soils. Okay, it's the result of intense weathering, but the intense weathering is not as strong as we would see as a result uh, as we would see in oxisols. Okay, they're often redder in color than alpha soils due to that oxide increase. increase. Okay, distribution worldwide. Not that far off of that Pangaea picture. If we go back to that Pangaea picture, these are those older landscapes. Southeast United States, Brazil, Central Africa. And look at where the distribution of these things are. Now, there's a good chunk of it up here in, in China and Southeast Asia. But look at where the distribution is, basically right where that Pangaea circle is. These are older landscapes. United States. Dominantly right in here. Now, I don't know if you guys remember when I was talking about the glaciation and I talked about the Salamanca retrenchment. It's the only part of New York State that wasn't under glaciation. Do you see this little pocket right up there? That little chunk of New York State that's got color? That's that Salamanca retrenchment. So this sort of speaks to that discussion earlier about oxisols. Why do we not have ultisols up in here or oxisols up here? Because there was some sort of process, whether it's a volcano, in this case it happens to be glaciation, that brought fresh material on site. Okay? In this case, in New York State, this little section of New York State didn't get the fresh material. And as a result, we have more weathered soils in that one little spot. Does that make sense? Okay. So what do these soils look like? 
oranges, reds, like the oxysols, yellows, okay? The landscape is much different than around here though, and these soils are really good agricultural soils. You just have to be a little bit better at your nutrient management, okay? You bring fertility in here, whether it's through fertilizer or through permaculture or through organic matter, whatever it happens to be that you're bringing it in, these soils are very, very productive. Very good soils for agriculture, as well as for everything else. What do some of these soils look like further south? You're starting to see, that in this case, you're starting to see some, this is BT, BTY or whatever. You're looking at some clay accumulations in here, okay? Iron accumulations. In fact, enough iron accumulations that you basically can create, make bricks out of these things. You cut these things out, let them dry, and they basically become like bricks, okay? I think I have some other slides of this one. Do I have some more? No, I don't. Um, any questions about this one? Any more questions about this? Go. Um, there's two, so the question is, how do you differentiate these guys from oxysols? Uh, in the field, these are definitely on the red end of the spectrum. You can take, generally look at the vegetation and have some sort of idea about it, but that's sort of a, you know, that's not really that great of an idea. Generally, you know where you are and you can have an idea there, but the reality is the way to figure this out is to take a look at the clay accumulations. These soils, the oxysols, the entire profile has been basically weathered away. In these guys, you're still having soil processes, and so uh, soil, younger soil processes, younger weathering, okay? And so as a result, you're gonna still see zones of accumulation and zones of losses. In the oxysols, everything's basically been lost. In these, you're gonna see these BT horizons. You're not gonna see a BT horizon in an oxysol. The whole, the whole soil is going to be clay. In this, I've got a zone of, of accumulation clay. I still have sea horizons. They're younger is really what I'm looking for. I'm looking for um, features of soil genesis. Does that make sense? Does that sort of get the idea? Yeah? Would your oxisol generally be uh, No, we can go back and take a look at those oxisol pictures. So I guess that's, you know, and these soils, so the question was, are the oxysols going to be lower in acidity than the, more acidic? Then, more acidic? That really depends upon the climate. Okay. Um, so acidity is really going to be driven by the climate and certainly the vegetation. But in these soils, you're red throughout, but you can see that except for the top, generally the horizons here are pretty much the same. Okay, there's certain depths, but, you know, I've got organic material at the top, but from, from here down, I got some structural change up but from here down, it's basically all the same stuff. Can't really see in that one. Let's go back one slide. This one, maybe this one. I see some organic matter, but basically all the way through this, I've got the same stuff, okay? There's not BTs in here. There's no zones of accumulation. Things have weathered so much in this scenario that I, the, hor the horizons have become really thick. They're, the distinction between the horizons are sort of washed out. It's not nice, clean, abrupt horizons that we see around here, okay? You move into these ultisoils. I've got horizons, I've got E horizons in there. You know, that's what I'm looking for. Does that make sense? 